Shabbat Shalom. So we're, uh, I've mentioned a few books. Well, I've mentioned one book. I'm going to send out an email next week. Uh, by saying it out loud, that means it'll definitely happen. That I'll send out an email next week uh, with some of the books uh, that I hope people would consider reading in the days leading up to the holidays or perhaps during the holidays. Um, but one that I'm uh, looking at again this year that I know, uh, I know many of you have looked at before is, uh, is by Rabbi Alan Liu. Uh, this is Real and You're Totally Unprepared. Is that, is that the title? This is it. Completely unprepared. Completely unprepared. Uh, and it's a it's a it's a deep dive into the theology and the structure of the high holy days and how we should approach them. So I would tell you, um, it's uh, it's like going to therapy and preparing for even more therapy in in the high holy days. If that's what you want from the holidays this year, then read this book. Uh, and in the uh, in the section I was reading this week. Uh, he tells a story of uh, being outside with his son, who I, I sensed was older, I mean a grown son at the time, and they, it started to rain, and so they ducked into their little garden house uh, because it was pouring in their backyard. And he's looking out the window, uh, and his son says, isn't it beautiful? And Rabbi Lou is looking out, and he's like, he can't see anything beautiful. And his son says, no, look at the window itself. Don't look through the window to the world. The world is ugly right now. It's pouring down rain. But look inside the window panes, and you can see there's this whole little world happening inside the window. There's bugs in there, and there are like spider webs, and it's all, it's all these colors. And it's, if you, they were stuck inside this little shed. And he looked at it closely, and he was in awe, as his son was, at what was happening in this window that every other time he would simply just look through. And he uses that story as his example of what we should be doing in preparation for the High Holy Days. And what he means by that is, he says, he writes in the chapter, he says, we have to shift our gaze from the world itself, the world out there, to the window through which we see it. Because that window is not just blank and transparent. The window is a world unto itself. He says it's a world teeming with life and that that life affects what we see. So I think the question that he poses on us, he wrote this book many years ago, but especially in today's world, would be, so what window do we normally look out and see the world through? It's not normally the garden window. Is it CNN? Is it Fox News? Is it the morning paper? Is it the emails that we get? Is it what pops up on Facebook? What is the lens through which we're seeing the world 363 days a year? And then how can we, on the days when we're in our sanctuary at our holiest days of the year, how can we be sure that we can see the world differently on those days? Because the goal is that after the holidays, you'll know you've done the holidays well if you see the world differently after the holidays than you saw the world before. So uh, I would almost say it's become a tradition that sometime around this time of year, I like to give a plug for Yom Kippur, uh, which is counterintuitive, because if there's a holiday that people show up to the synagogue for, it's Yom Kippur. Uh, however, I often feel, as I look out at the sanctuary and see everybody show up, mostly, for the 1030 service, and then see most people depart after the 1030 service, that you're coming for just a slice of what Yom Kippur should feel like. And those who stay all day get what I feel for myself, and I hope for others, is the full sense of Yom Kippur. So here's, how, here's my yearly plug. And then I want to share one little tidbit for my teacher that I think has to do with how this lens can look differently if we prepare. So Yom Kippur officially begins with Kol Nidre, and the sound that we often close our eyes for and hear the cello uh, and the cantor chant Kol Nidre and the somber and serious nature of that evening in which uh, we wear a talus at night, one of the only times we wear a talus at night uh, formally. 
The morning begins with the morning service, not so drastically different. A serious morning to do our inner reflection and to read some of the most challenging prayers uh, that we have, to reflect on life and death and the opening of a book and the closing of a book, and to ask ourselves those heavy questions that were taught from the youngest age. Just today, I solidified, I was grateful for, our Yom Kippur Social Justice Panel, which is, again, under the theme of going back to normal. Coming back, we will have a panel on Yom Kippur afternoon. Uh, we're focusing on uh, the role of religion in civic society. Uh, we have three guests. Uh, one is a uh, emeritus law professor from Case Western uh, who once clerked for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, one is a OBGYN who for the last 20 years has been doing abortion work. And uh, one is uh, Reverend Nanette Pitt from uh, from the first uh, congregational UCC church in downtown Akron. And they're going to share with us how religion has impacted our civic life and perhaps how religion can impact our civic life going forward. So we move from the serious service in the morning into our serious issues. This year we'll then go out into this space, which is something new, for our family service at 3 o'clock, the afternoon service, where we hear the story of Jonah and our, our youth are going to participate. Uh, and we're going to utilize this space. And we go back inside for the Abu Dha service, which some of you may remember uh, in the last few years uh, prior to the pandemic was a uh, musical service, a meditative musical service, we called it, I believe. We have beautiful music where it's really less about words and more about listening. Then we have Yizker uh, to remember all of those uh, that we've lost, especially recently. And then we conclude my favorite service of Yom Kippur uh, in the Ila, where uh, we, it's a brief service, we share Havdalah, and we look back on the 24 hours as if it's been a week, uh, that we've gone through this together, and that we get to start fresh. That's the part I think I, I, I really bugs me that people miss. They miss the finish line. It's like they run the hardest part of the race, and then they cut out before the good part. Uh, and so, uh, that's the trajectory. That's, that's what this lens of Yom Kippur looks like. Now, if you were paying attention, right in that little part, there was a part where I said there's an Avodah service. The Avodah service used to be it. That was where the high priest in the temple would take the goat, and they would do the scapegoat ceremony, and they would let this goat go free, and they would sacrifice the other goat. Now, this was the big moment on Yom Kippur. That became, after thousands of years, our meditative musical service. Quite different. Different imagery, different sounds. But it's, it was rethought. Of course, it was rethought after we no longer made sacrifices. It was rethought after the destruction of the temple. And it was rethought when our new prayer book was created. And in that rethinking as to what this service should be on the afternoon of Yom Kippur when perhaps we have not so many people in our sanctuaries, but this used to be the core of the service of what we would do on Yom Kippur. How do we make this feel special? Rabbi Richard Levy of Blessed Memory, who, uh, who was one of my professors, and I've, I've spoken of many times, and who, as Rabbi Horowitz would say, uh, was uh, infused with God in the way classical reform was, but he had a different theology than classical reform, but he, he, was, he talked about God all the time. Here's what he said the questions were, should be, when you think about the Avodah service in the middle of Yom Kippur afternoon. Used to be the service where the high priest would make the biggest sacrifice. He says, here are four questions to ask yourself. If you were the high priest, who would you want to bring close to God this year? And how? And how would you do it through the life you live now? That's question one. Question two. If you were entrusted with the knowledge of words as powerful as the name of God, what other words would you like to know? And how might you use the power of those words to bring good things to the world? In other words, what are the things you would say this year that would make the world better? Number three. If you were the high priest, and you were prostrating yourself in submission to the most powerful being imaginable, what would you pray for this year? 
What is the most important prayer for you right now if you were laying down, prostrating yourself before God? And four, when the Israelites were on the way to the promised land, they built a prototype of the temple called a mishkan, a structure that helped them experience God in their midst. And the process of building that structure was called melacha, work. The same words, the same word that describes the work that we do every day. So question four is, what is holy about the work you do every day? What can you identify about your work that contributes to the building of a center for holiness? In what ways do you, or might you, act as a priest in a holy space this year? Asked on any other day of the year, perhaps these questions seem absurd. But on Yom Kippur, we speak that way. The question that Rabbi Alan Liu asks us is, are we ready to see the world that way? Are we ready to look through, ask ourselves those questions, and be ready to come out of Yom Kippur looking at the world differently? And so now is the time to get ready, to ask ourselves how we see the world now. What news are we listening to? What news should we turn off? What are the books we want to pick up? What are the questions? Perhaps Rabbi Levy's questions are not the right questions for you. But what would be the sacred, important, holy questions that you need to ask yourself on Yom Kippur so that we can leave Yom Kippur and look out at the world in a different way? It is that time of year where we ask ourselves to start thinking this way, to remembering the faces that we miss, to honoring the people who are in our lives, to being together as a community, to making these days holy so that they fit the description we give them. I look forward to having these days with you. For I know everybody who's here tonight will stay the whole day of Yom Kippur now. Uh, I do hope that however you spend Yom Kippur uh, and however you spend the holidays, that you find it meaningful, uh, that you find it to be filled with community.